Mom, get the camera. The Mariners are a game over 500. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Sawcast. I'm Patrick. I'm Matt. I'm Garrett. I'm Nate. And I'm Owen. That's right. For the time being, the Mariners are a game over 500. And June is officially in the books. July is here. And the Mariners are playing well. Who would have thunk? Well, you. Well, you, us. You've been saying it. The Mariners only get good in July. What happened? I mean, it's just, it, that's Mariners baseball, baby. Just couple months of just misery and I mean we we said from the beginning Mariners are notoriously slow starters and it's going to take a while for the weather to warm up and for them to start clicking but we also I mean we were getting pretty close to a breaking point ourselves we were getting pretty frustrated that we got end. real close yeah I mean the pot I mean the last episode we that is as critical as we've ever been about this team and it was needed changes needed to be made getting that win over 500 on the astros is so sweet especially dropping a 10 spot on it feels so good they're like whole fan base is crying on twitter i love it yeah we've been caught in the ebb and flow of the season all season hovering around 500 going over 500 one game two games maybe dropping a few games a couple series we shouldn't and uh, we've picked up ground. We've really picked up, picked up steam, and uh, everything's clicking right now. This last week has been the best version of this team that we've seen this season, and that's what we need. That's what we've wanted, and it looks good. The chemistry looks better. The players look like they have each other's backs out there, and I really like what I'm seeing. How about Mike Ford? Mike Ford. Built Ford tough, baby. That dude is... Built Ford runs. <laughs> He's he, hitting bombs. He's, dude, he, he's much, not only hitting bombs, he's hitting the ball all over the field. Clears the like, bases today. He's like this year's Carlos Santana, but like honestly, even maybe a little better. I think his numbers contact wise. Yeah, his numbers are better than Santana this year, like OPS and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Clutch um, factor guys on base he's hitting. Yeah, I mean, and who would have thunk Mike Ford was on four teams last year, one of them being the Mariners, and he bounced around. Came back to the Mariners on a minor league contract, and we were like, oh, my God, this guy again. And he has he has learned to hit a baseball. And the Mariners did say it, during spring training that Ford had completely revamped his hitting approach in Tacoma, and now we're seeing the fruits of his labors. He is he's smacking the hell out of the ball. It's awesome. He can generate insane power, and we've seen that. But he can also pepper the ball around the field, which is awesome. In the last seven games, Mike Ford has the highest OPS in the American League (laughs) at 1.385. Dude, yes. Yeah, and J.P. Crawford is third with 1.205. Eugenio Suarez is fourth with 1.160. So we have three Mariners in the top five OPS for the last seven games, which is really nice. This is the first time this has happened this year. We have something good to talk about. It's so crazy to be in the top five of a hitting statistic that isn't strikeouts. I was going to say, have we checked on those in a while? Are we still have three guys in it? I know we are still striking out like crazy. That has not changed. The Mariners are going to be a K team, but they're now getting hits in between those strikeouts. Look at today's game as an example against the Astros, the 10 run shellacking we gave them. Their pitcher got chased after three innings, so nine outs. Total, he had eight strikeouts. Eight of his nine outs were strikeouts. But then the Mariners still hit him around. So, you know, take what you can get. Yeah, the Mariners have been striking out a lot still. Like, in the last week, even though the team has been hitting really well, like, they've struck out the most, 75 times. (laughs) Ten more times than the Kansas City Royals. And our walks, though, we've been taking more walks. Like, we've been working pitchers and working counts better. 23 walks, and the Yankees have 29. The Orioles have 24. We're third with 23 walks in the last seven games, too. So, while we're striking out a lot, if our offense can be producing at the rate they have been or, like, show any kind of life, like this whole last week has been electric, 
if they can keep that up, then the strikeouts are okay. And that's what we were thinking earlier this year. We just haven't seen all of this come together in this way yet. I just looked it up. Tay Oscar is tied with Kyle Schwarber uh, for 114 strikeouts this year. And then Kalanix in third. <laughs> Oof. Love it. I mean, yeah, but the strikeouts are kind of hurting, but... I mean, if everyone else is clicking, it doesn't really matter. If you get th- if they strike out the side, but you also hit four doubles and a single and scored like three runs, you know, it doesn't really matter how many Ks they get. Well, let's run it back. This last week, we've we've really done well. We ended up taking the Tampa Bay series after getting crushed the first game. There was a players only meeting before that shellacking we took. Yeah, right? it was before that game. Which probably wasn't the wisest time to have a players only meeting. So I saw that like Lou Pinella used to schedule meetings like that for the players on games that Randy Johnson was pitching because they had the highest probability of winning that game. So, you know, kind of boost the player morale. The Mariners decided to do it against a pitcher that had the best ERA. In the American League, if not all of baseball. So probably not the wisest decision. Um, They scored four runs in the second inning and then got one hit after that. And then they had that complete and total collapse in the eighth inning. Yeah, we chased McClanahan after three, though. So we did get to him. Yeah, I think he went right back onto the IL. It was his first start back from the IL, and he went right back on. So he was having some sort of issue other than us making him work a little bit, which we did. But, I mean, he had other things going on as well. I mean, everything was coming to a head, and the players-only meeting needed to happen at some point. And the energy did change coming out of June there. That was June 30th when that game happened, that meeting happened. And going into July, there was a new energy coming from this team, a new fire, a new uh, competitiveness that we haven't seen yet. And uh, they're turning it into a habit. Like, we've won, what is this, eight out of the last nine games now? And we just kicked the shit out of the Astros the last couple days. They look a little flat. They're missing Jordan Alvarez. They're missing Jose Altuve. Yeah, Altuve just went back on the IL with an oblique strain, so he's going to be out for a little bit. I mean, our team's coming up with some sort of energy we haven't seen. That We took the series from San Fran, two games out of three, and Alex Cobb pitched a great game against us in the third game, and we only lost two to zero. Um, I mean, we had... A plenty of chances to win that game late in the game if we put a few things together. The Astros were down so many players, like you guys said, but they had Altuve out, Alvarez was out, McCullers was out, their Garcia is out, and we don't have to see Christian Javier pitch against us. I mean, we had a lot going for us, and they t- totally capitalized on it. They got the first two of four. Hopefully we can win the series, not split the series. That'd be awesome. Honestly, though, even a split at this point is... Is good. That's I mean, all I wanted going into this series. And yeah, we, I mean, before the calendar turned in July, bless the Mariners. I mean, the best you could hope for is, you know, oh, maybe if we can not get swept by the Astros. But now it's the sun is out and the Mariners are heating up right with it. And yeah, I mean, let's take the series. It's very possible. Let's get greedy. Let's sweep the series. Let's this go. The road first- sweep. The first big wave we've caught so far. Let's ride it as far as we can straight into the All-Star break. Just win out. I think it is possible to win it out. Um, we got Wu going against uh, Valdez tomorrow. Could be a tough matchup. Wu looked good his last matchup, though. And then uh, coming to you Sunday, we got Gilbert versus Biliak, one of their one of their newer guys. He's been all right this year, 4-4 four and four with a 3.81 ERA, but Gilby is coming off a complete game shutout um, against San Fran, so hopefully he keeps that rolling and just, yeah, just shit on them. Let's not breeze right by that. Logan Gilbert's complete game shutout was fucking epic. That was so cool. Oh, my God. What a performance. And, I mean, he gave up just scattered five hits throughout the game, never really got in too much trouble. 
Uh, he had a chance. I mean, it would have been a miracle, but he had a chance for a Maddox, which is a complete game shutout under he only 100 pitches. He missed it by like five pitches, though. And I think he threw yeah. 104 pitches total. Dude, let's go. What an outstanding performance by Logan Gilbert. And you've noticed the rest of our pitching staff has kind of picked up recently as well. They started off the year on fire, and the Mariners just couldn't hit. And then they also started to suck, and the Mariners still weren't hitting. And now we're back to locking in at the same time. Bats are cooking up and down the lineup. Everyone is making plays and getting clutch hits. And our pitching staff is coming back around. Our strikeouts have been a little bit down. Castillo is working on some new stuff. Or not new stuff, like pitches-wise, but just like how he's attacking the zone. Because his he was trying way too hard out there, and his walks were through the roof. So it's nice that he's kind of wheeled that back in reeled that back in and instead of just trying to strike everyone out just getting them out the other ways yeah. along along with gilbert's complete game shutout let's not breeze past that again because logan gilbert threw a complete game shutout fucking phenomenal on the fourth of july by the way on america the 4th, america Woo. and other than his stuff being like electric and dialed back in i saw him having like his attitude back like he was he was bringing some spice he was fired up after you know every other strikeout he was he was feeling it and it's good to see that again uh i've seen it from our offense as well now guys will hit a double and be fired up we're not looking like the same team we did there for that little stretch near the end of june uh where we were looking kind of dismal yeah, I mean, the pitching staff has been awesome. Logan Gilbert's complete game shut out on the 4th of July. Five hits, seven Ks, no walks. Are you kidding? That's amazing. He's the horse, too. Like, it was a question, or was it a question, whether he was going back in in the ninth? All the players in the dugout said no. They were chanting, Logan, Logan, Logan. Like, don't even call the relief pitcher in the bullpen right now. Like, he's going out there. I know he's at 96 pitches, but, dude, he's the guy to do it. He's the horse. You can throw up to 125 pitches at this point in the season. He's he's ready. Um, he was amazing. He was amazing, and I, I just expect that from him more often. He's going to be our horse. He's going to step up into that role and be a rock in our our rotation every time he takes the ball. He has that fire in him. Walter's coming out, and Walter's here to stay. Really nice to see uh, Scott not do some bullshit, save metrics, and pull him. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, you never know with Scott. He could always try and pull some crap, so it was kind of nice to let the players play and let Logan finish what he started, and rightfully so. I mean, it's not like he was laboring out there. He was in control of that entire game, so... Glad he got was able to go out there and finish it up, and he finished it up quick, too. I think it was like a seven-pitch final inning. Patrick, you talked about uh, how July is the Mariners' month. I think that's pretty true, especially now with like how the other teams in the West are kind of going. Uh, we talked about how the Astros are down a bunch of stars. I mean, the Angels just lost Trout for like six weeks, and... Trout and Otani are carrying that team. So they just lost one of their main like contribution points. And then we've talked about Texas, who are still some on shit right now, but it's not I don't think it's sustainable. So I think like this month of July, like after the break, we can make up a ton of lost ground. I mean, Texas looks pretty sustainable. The Angels look like they're on the precipice of a Full on collapse with Trout out, Rendon out. They already lost Rendon. their rookie Neto, who was playing shortstop pretty well for them. Also, uh, Otani is dealing with a blister right now as well. Yeah, so he can't pitch until. I mean, we'll see what happens after the All Star break. I'm sure he's gonna make his start after the All Star break and see how that goes. We have the same issue with Bryce Miller right now, so we'll see. I mean, I don't see the Angels staying where they are. They're collapsing already they're on like a three four game losing streak and the mariners are on the upswing here the astros are pretty flat i think if we sweep the astros here we're only two games behind them and what like five six games out from the lead in the wild card standings and approaching texas texas looks good though i think they can hold it together as long as their pitching holds it together but that's what i like about the mariners is they're their pitching and defense drives this team forward, and if the offense goes, it's hard to lose. 
We Speak- sweep, sweep the Astros here. We're two games back in the wild card, pending what uh, that would be pending the Yankees and Red Sox also sweeping their series. But we're currently four games back in the wild card um, behind Houston and Toronto, who are tied. Wow, closer than I thought. So, yeah, I mean, the Mariners are right in it. We're definitely aiming for that wild card spot. And if Texas ends up collapsing and the Mariners surge, anything can happen in the second half of the season. If the Mariners are hot the second half, I mean, I foresee them overtaking the Angels easily and approaching. Yeah, then the yeah we're approaching the Astros. We'll see what happens. I mean, I think the Mariners are going to keep what they're doing now and turn it turn it into something real. I'm just here for an Angels collapse. <laughs> Aren't we all? We're we were all wondering when it was going to happen. It's just a matter of time. The Angels are going to Angels. And I, the Rangers, yeah, they they have a good squad over there. But I did see there was like a 25-game stretch where they were 10 and 15 in their last 25. So they're not infallible. Like, they can be beaten. You can get to them. They do have a nice squad over there. But, I mean, the Mariners are a good team. We've just been waiting for them to get good. And it's... If they, you know, we don't want to jump the gun too early, but we have seen this before. The calendar turns and the Mariners' stock rises way up. If they can keep this up, I think the division can be up for grabs this year. Even looking outside of the division, the Rays are struggling a little bit. I think they just lost their fifth game in a row. They're on a six-game losing streak. Six-game losing streak? (laughs) Yeah, so no one's completely infallible. Yeah. You know, teams like the Rangers and the Rays are going to have these stretches as well. But it's a perfect time for the Mariners to capitalize, get hot, and ride this out. Hell yeah. Yeah, make waves in the division. And the Mariners started that losing streak for them. So we're making a difference in the league when we're good. I think if the Mariners are able to grab those early leads, our bullpen is super locked down. Our starting pitching has been great. Uh, if we're able to grab early leads, it's it's back to the same old formula we've been seeing. And that's what we've needed is to be able to get runs early and, and start capitalizing on moments where we really need to. Bases loaded, runners on with one or no outs. And we've been capitalizing on all of that type of stuff recently and like being more clutch that is huge the hitting with the bases loaded it's not a death sentence anymore it used to be the worst position the mariners could be in is like the bases loaded and no outs because you know they weren't going to do shit with it and they have been cooking uh mike ford bases clearing double today kellenick has had a bases clearing triple Julio came up with the bases loaded and smoked a single through the right side. Just timely hitting. It's it's so fun to watch. Seeing the product as it is this last week makes me think we've been putting a lot of pressure on like, what do we add? What do we add? But we've been waiting for the the talent to perform right it, it all comes down to the players it starts and ends with the players we ended up talking about the front office Scott service and what happens though is the players go out there and they have to win they have to do what they need to do to win and we were searching and searching and searching for answers for so long that you know we got out of the realm of what's happening and things are clicking now it looks like they have each other's backs, and I really I like the energy they have now. This team is going to be good. Like I've been saying all season, this team is good, just not right now. They they're in sh- you know shambles emotionally, and things are really coming around. They're making adjustments really well, and and getting it done. I love it. Also, how about this for all the Mariners performing? AJ Pollock hit a home run with Colton Wong on base. That was wild. I never thought I'd see the day. <laughs> Who would have thought those were just kids' tales? <laughs> it's a sign. I hate seeing Colton Wong do good. I hate seeing him succeed. Uh, I just want him gone. It's I like every time no. he does something positive, it's just like, that's another inch of rope you get. <laughs> it's, eye, it's, it's eyebrow raising. 
why, why wouldn't you rather see him be good yeah. though than like trade Owen's just for a someone? hater? Oh my I am God. a hater. He's fucking bad, bro. <laughs> I, it raises my eyebrows. You want to like, keep hey. him around like we kept around? I'd, I'd rather have no. him be good than like sell the farm and get another second baseman. We don't got to sell the farm. We have Cab Iero. Yeah. yeah. Well, we're looking for that left-handed bat. What is solution? He's better than Wong, bro. What has Wong got that Cabs doesn't have? Nothing. Not shit. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's true. I don't want to see Wong do bad though. <laughs> yeah. I want to yeah. see him do hating. good. No, I mean the worst. But he I does, do the agree. We, we don't need him on the team. Wong right. is this a... is like the first good game Wong's had in like four months. Did you see him try and take third base today and got thrown out by 130 feet? <laughs> no, that shit I was, was I, not close. I was uh, at the HBCU game, so. He got thrown out at third when he was halfway between first and second. I think. <laughs> Dude, it was bad. He hit. What could have been a double down the first baseline, he rounds second, like halfway between second and third, he's out at third. <laughs> and he's just like, oh, okay, those last six steps must have been pure pain for that guy. <laughs> yeah. I just mean, staring uh, at a guy with a ball in his <laughs> hand. Like, what am I going to do here? <laughs> I will say that was the inning where we scored nine runs, though. Yeah, but that's how that inning ended. Yeah. It has Not, to end. Okay. It has I'm, to end sometime, and he was trying to be aggressive and get third because he's putting killer. the pressure on them while the pressure's already on. Like he has, to, he's forcing them to make that throw and catch and tag. And I mean, it was a bad decision, but at the same time, it's on top of nine runs. Like whatever, let's let's get this game rolling as well. Yeah. Not that he's thinking that. I'm sure he wants to be safe, but <laughs> at the same time, he's putting in. But the pressure on them when they're already down and out. When that tag got laid down, Owen was so excited. I was hyped. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, out, oh, yes! That is one, one step closer to DFA. Sorry, I don't mean to be a hater. Hey, not. Yes, you do. <laughs> I, have, I have a short like fuse for players that we get and we're excited for, and they just play like crap, and then they do like a couple cool things, good things, and we're like, nah, let's just keep them around for a while. I mean, like, I, what is yeah. Winker shining? The only thing, the, literally the only thing I can think of Winker is that he fought the Angels dugout. And Frazier, he turned it around a little bit in the last half of the season, but it was still bad. Maybe He's Colton having a great Wong. year in Baltimore. Maybe Colton Wong can turn it around in the second half like Frazier did. I remember Frazier slacking in the first half and really getting hot in the second half and helping us out. I think Colton Wong is decent in the field. He's proved that he can snag it. No. He's he's come around. Have you no, been watching not. recently? I no, mean, I no, I haven't been watching. He's recently. been playing with been a good energy. I think. I mean, I'm with you though. I've been calling for the DFA, and the better he does, you, the farther Colton, away we get. From good that. energy doesn't fill up the stats. Colton Wong is a, this man's Jared Kelenic to me. He can no, not. <laughs> he can platoon with. Caballero, if he's playing well enough to do that, and if he proves that he's playing well enough to, like at least platoon with Cabs while he also plays other positions, then great. We have a left-handed, right-handed little platoon, and Colton Wong can be useful if he's good. He's lately. Let's see. I've been trying to look this up here. He's still not. He's still, he's still not, not good. good. Yeah, no, I'm I mean like, four for twenty-three. Discussion ended here. One seventy-four. <laughs> 261 slug. This is, I mean, that's bad. I'm still thinking that we can upgrade there, but the better he does, the better for the Mariners. He was also in a post game interview earlier this week where he said himself he's slumped before, but never quite like this. And it's like, dude, he finally admitted he's terrible. So he knows. Is that the turnaround that he needed? I don't know. Yeah, <clears throat> saying it out loud. What, like, turn it around? The last step of Manifest, like bargaining dude. is acceptance or whatever. <laughs> yeah, he, <laughs> the five stages of grief. Yeah. He's at acceptance. He's like, yeah, it's bad. Also, another player that is literally only had one huge moment, and we extended him, is Dylan Moore. He hit that grand slam against, that Astro, and against the Astros for that massive comeback when the Mariners were down like 7 nothing in the first inning. And he came and hit the game leading grand slam in like the eighth inning. And we that was huge and we expected more for him, but Demo is just not the dude. Yeah, unpopular opinion, I, I guess, on this podcast. I really dislike Demo. I think he should have been gone a while ago. 
He does have that like three year extension. We, uh, so. Do you remember not last year, but the year before? So twenty. Oh god, I'm stupid. Twenty twenty one. No. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Twenty twenty one. You know what year it is. Do I? You got it. Barely. We, uh, <laughs> it was like we were st- chasing that wild card spot super hard, and it got down to like the last three games, and we oh, put yes. Demo in the outfield, and he misplayed a ball so badly that we lost the game. I don't know if it was the last game or the second to last game, but we ended up missing the wild card spot, and it's just like that is just burned into my brain of this man just misplaying a pop-up and us losing and missing the playoffs. As someone who's been chasing the playoffs for 20 years, this is like... You fucker. <laughs> Demo I mean, makes Owen toss and turn at night. Yeah. We've said on this podcast earlier in the season, when Demo comes back, what can you really expect him to bring to the team? And we all said nothing. Mediocrity. Dude, he's batting 40 right now. Wow, yeah. damn. Lower oh, than Colton oh, Wong. 40. That's crazy. He has one hit, and it's a home run. He struck out 16 times, walked three times. That's it. One stolen base. He like comes in pinch runs. He's a fast left fielder and sometimes misplays balls out there because he's not a natural outfielder. I don't know what, what to say about Dylan Moore. I'm, it sucks he's had problems with injuries, but the, what we've seen from him isn't viable. So I'm not sure. Sam Haggerty's doing what in AAA? I don't know. So Probably he had a home run the other day. Probably better to just put him on our roster than Dylan Moore for now until we can trade for an upgrade for a zero spot on our roster. I mean, I'm kind of glad we're at the point right now where we're not like having to rely on a utility player like Demo to be our guy like we did in 2021 in that season. Um, I mean, now we have pretty much anyone else can fill in for him. I mean, it sucks that he's doing bad. He, you know, provided us some great moments. Seems like a cool dude, but it's nice that we do have better players than a career utility player right now, except for at second base. Also, with Haggerty down in AAA, I did see he's kind of popping off a little bit down there in Tacoma, but what if we got rid of Haggerty, Demo, Wong, and we you we got a second baseman in a trade. Not saying obviously we trade those guys for an elite second baseman, but acquire a second baseman, and then use Cabs as kind of the all around guy that can be put wherever. I don't think he has the outfield maneuverability like Demo does. Haggerty doesn't really either, even though we put him out there sometimes. So I don't think that he necessarily needs to be the all-around guy, but to have him fill in in the infield would be nice. I like this. The Mariners having this ultra-utility guy is kind of just a floating piece on the roster that can fill in any hole we have. And right now, do we really need more infield, outfield-type players? No. We need to shore up sure-thing position players. If we get a second baseman that can platoon with Caballero. Caballero yeah, Caballero can play third base. He can play shortstop. We don't really want to force him to play outfield, but that's okay because on our bench we should have another outfielder. We should have a utility outfielder that can steal a base and pinch run just like a guy like Dylan Moore can, like Colton Wong can. Uh it's, there's easily replaceable guys on our roster, and it sucks that we extended Dylan Moore for a few years and he has a little bit of run on his uh, contract because then we're kind of dumping Dylan Moore's contract in a trade with somebody too. Like He's not an attractive player right now, so it's hard to trade him for anything. Maybe the Mets will take him and then eat his contract and DFA him. <laughs> yeah, the Mets love to... Just pay people's contracts? Yeah, we've done yeah. it a couple times now. I mean, they took like half of Flexin's contract. He lasted like 27 minutes before <laughs> yeah. they DFA'd him. Yeah, what was even... I do not know. I do not know what the Mets were doing with that. Why trade for a player, take on half of his salary, and then DFA him immediately? The Mets are a mystery over there. I don't know what they're doing, but we'll take it. Collapsing. Maybe they didn't like have an option to put to him do. in their minor league system, and so they... Get him, DFA him, hope no one 
claims him off the waivers and then puts it, that puts him in triple A. So he's around for them. That's actually a pretty good point. Yeah, that is think, actually a really good that's point. Probably he was, he was out of options. That's why we didn't send him down. We had to DFA him. Yeah, or trade him. Who was going to trade for him? For the, Mets the, Mets. the Mets. Oh, yeah. No, I was thinking, never mind. Tommy Malone. <laughs> Scratch all that. I was oh, thinking also, Tommy Malone. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Man, he's getting done dirty. Poor. Well, we can cover some roster moves now that we're talking about it. Yeah, the poor Tommy Malone. Feel bad for the dude that's twice now he has been called up. And he has performed well in both starts. The Mariners didn't give him any run support this last game. And the time before that, early on in the season, he got the spot start. And he came up, no run support, pitched well, DFA'd again. <laughs> poor, poor Tommy Malone. Yeah, I texted you guys the other day, do you guys feel bad for Tommy Malone? And I got two no's. And I was like, I feel bad for the guy. I feel bad for I him. I mean, we got some reasoning. He's 36 years old. He knows where he's at in his career. He knows that he's the guy that can be called upon in AAA, and he's going to be that first guy they call in that pool. They're going to say, okay, Tommy, one more time, baby. And he's going to be like, yes, I've been waiting for this moment to do it one more time to go spin four and two-thirds innings because <laughs> I haven't thrown five innings, but I'm going to yeah. go do it the best I can. And I think he's accepted that role in his life, dude. If you're a 36-year-old AAA guy that gets called upon once every so often, depending on injury. Two, three times a year. Yeah. When and I mean, you got to give the, you a call you and say, shot, hey, man, bro. we're out of double A guys. You want to pitch? And he goes, yeah. I'm sure everyone's on the <laughs> same page, and he knows that it's kind of the end of his career anyway. He I might know as he well. Knows, but that's sad. It, 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 it is a bummer. I mean, you better. It's not like the Mariners, like, hey, come spot start, and then, like, actually, we're going to ban you from baseball forever. You can't come back. <laughs> better to he go know, out. He knows he's going to be, like, put on the, the waiver and then come back. He just knows. Yeah. Okay. Or someone's going to pick him up and he's going to find I more. Still feel bad I get, for the guy. No, and I totally get it. And it makes sense. And baseball is a business and you're trying to win. You know, you're, you don't have time really for feelings and, you know, sunshine and rainbows. I get it doesn't change the fact that it completely sucks for this guy it's just basically he's a disposable pawn piece of meat and he does well it's not like he comes up just to be like an inning eater that gets absolutely shelled and it's like oh it's a throwaway game put him out there for like 10 runs who gives a shit no he comes up and he performs well and then has to take that bus ride back to Tacoma I, I do feel bad for the dude I get it still sucks I guess I could feel bad for him, but the longevity he's had, the health he's had to be able to do that for the Mariners has been super helpful. And I mean, we're giving him props. Like, Mariners Hall of Fame for Tommy Malone. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if we need to go that far. Not that many props. But yeah, I mean, he's been helpful, man. And just being around and knowing that we're going to DFA him and pick him back up and do it one more time. I feel like that was probably the last time. Are we going to use Tommy Malone again? Shit, I don't know, man. But we also got rid of Flexen and got. We yeah. picked up Zach Muckenhern. Yeah, who's on our minor league roster. He's left-handed. Yeah. And then... Um, He's also played like six games or something. Also, another double double A guy called up. Isaiah Campbell came up, made his debut today in a relief appearance and pitched well. So I got his first strikeout of his career. Yep. Good job, Isaiah. That's Solid. what's up. Welcome to the bigs, dog. Yeah. We're in Houston and we called him on over from Arkansas and joined in our bullpen. Got in late in the game here and yeah, I got his first strikeout. He looks good. He looks good. I think the Mariners can't go wrong with any pitcher they call up this season. That's our strength. We're just going to keep doing it and surprise <laughs> everybody. No matter what pitcher we call up, they're just going to slay. And uh, there, there's no there's no two uh, shits about it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a new phrase. Coin it here. Stamp it. Cheers. <laughs> Did you guys see the uh, play on Thursday against the Astros where uh, JP fielded that ground ball and then Chaz McCormick slapped Ty France? 
Slapped his glove. Ooh. Yeah. Uh, reminder of like the A Rod in the the playoffs fiasco. Oh, with definitely. The 2004 ALDS. That's when right. Slap the glove. Slap the glove. Uh, McCormick on the Astros was trying to do that as well. Uh, definitely reached over and grabbed Ty France's arm when he was trying to catch the ball. That was uh, some Bush League bullshit. There's no way else to put it. That's up there with Machado, Cleeton, that guy at first when he was on the Dodgers during the playoffs and A-Rod's playoff thing. Obviously, this is a playoff game, but still, it's up there with one of those dirtiest first base interactions I've ever seen. I mean, bitch made. What bitch else, made. What else do you expect from the Astros? Though? Like, that's, they're they're going to be a dog shit franchise that does dirty shit like that it's their culture over there yeah. the Astros and they know culture, ty bro. france has wrist problems especially that left wrist because that's the one he's always gotten hit on a pitch with he got what last year he was out for three weeks when he caught a ball up the line and got his wrist ran into i mean that one yeah. was an accident but that, that one was, was an accident brutal McCormick, that one. yeah he went there was that other time where he got his ankle stepped on when he had an extension going and dude just crunched him yeah yeah Ty up gets on Ty beat France. the shit also, out of first. Along with him, I think the part that gets mixed about not only McCormick trying to like reach out and grab his wrist and s- twist it or slap it, but he was kind of inside the baseline. Like he was trying to bring like his left leg like inside of the baseline. Like he could have gone more to the dugout side of first base. You know, he was kind of I don't know. I didn't like that play. That looked really suspect. Yeah, it's definitely purposeful. I will like JP went deep into the hole and made that throw on a hop and it wasn't a short hop. It wasn't like a long low skip. It was kind of a medium hop that Ty France kind of had to like stand up and like take back at his shoulder, which was surprising probably to Chaz running down the line also, which, you know, I won't say it's a reactionary thing because it was definitely a purposeful motion. But when he saw the opportunity that, Ty France had to stand up and take this ball that's close to him. He slapped at the thing, and like that was very awkward and a terrible look for the Astros and Chaz McCormick. Uh, apparently, he texted Ty France after the game too and like apologized for doing that. But I mean, still Bush League. I know, fucking coat, bro. Just watching that, it's like, yeah, fuck the apology. Who cares? Like you. Yeah, that's dirty, dude. You just you never do that, even if you say it's reactionary, or whatever. Like you're protecting yourself from the ball because it was unexpected that it was gonna be that close to him. Like no way. Like and he hooked. He hooked and pulled. He was. Yeah, it was very he, obvious. Yeah. I mean, that would have been a penalty in hockey. So if he's apologizing, <laughs> he's admitting he did it. Yeah. Yeah. I was wondering if they were going to throw at him today, but then they put nine runs up on the board against him, and that hurts just as bad. Yeah, we were talking about that. Like, oh, you know, do you do you get a little revenge? Do you put one in his rib cage? And then the Mariners just started shit stomping the Astros all over their home turf, and and you know you don't need to plunk them because they're going to be thinking about that all night. Yeah, the Mariners came out and put it all over them on Friday here, like. The first inning, the second inning, we had runners on, but all of our outs came in strikeout form from Hunter Brown. He was on fire. And then the third inning, we left runners on again, right? And the fourth inning, we exploded. I don't know. We built up to it. It was runners on, runners on. And then by the time we chased their starter, it was game on. And we exploded nine runs all over them it's crazy how the mariners can put together like a great <laughs> inning <laughs> yeah 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 yep Got them five uh-huh mariners in their innings where they bat around like how do they do that that's magic it's it, it happens but it seems like they build up to it and then it's just flat again like they kind of equalize for a while but lately it's been a lot there's been a lot more of those innings where we're almost batting around or putting up four, or putting up five. And that feels good. I feel more confident that our offense is gonna string a few things together, even with two outs. Gotta pick up those crooked numbers. Yeah, fuck the Astros. Yeah. They're the worst. I hate them. 
I hate all their fans on Twitter. They're <laughs> coping so hard about these two losses. Like do like rightfully so. What yesterday was five one. Now it was uh, ten one. What 10-1 are they saying? Today? You you watch they're, the they're, well they just cope they're just like oh Mariners are trash bro poor legacy poor legacy they and always it, say that this is our World Series yeah yeah that's right they're like oh my God the Mariners winning two games before game series like you guys are just like jerking off to that shit it's just like <laughs> man, go fuck yourself bro they've always got something to say it hurts my brain after a while it's so dumb they call us little brother a lot on Twitter which I think is the most infuriating thing they could say to me. You're letting them get to you, man. I do. I I like. I just sit on Twitter and mauled, and I'm just like progressively get madder and madder. That's why I'm no longer on Twitter. Really. Yeah, I just block them all. Yeah, keep I can't, that. I hair. can't do Astros Twitter, bro. No, it's good to keep, keep, that keep that them. Hair, on. It's good to keep them. Like, yeah, you don't want to block people to make you mad. I want to, you know. No, I, 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 I I don't want to live like a cushy life. I want some adversity <laughs> in my life. I want to be angry on Twitter all the time. <laughs> I want them to make me. I'd mad. If I don't want to see shit on Twitter. Guess what? I just turn Twitter off. You know, like. I'd turn, rather they just listen turn to off our, the Twitter. I'd rather they listen to our podcast and we just keep beating them and we can just keep shit talking them. Speaking of uh, Astros players and stuff and hating their franchise, they have two. Astros on the all-star roster. They have a pitcher and Kyle Tucker. Jordan Alvarez was going to be there, but he's hurt right now, so he won't be at the all-star game, which is kind of a bummer. I do like Jordan. Uh, but I, I, I cannot wait to see how loud they get booed at T-Mobile, even though Kyle Tucker, is he wasn't even part of that crew or whatever. He is still an Astro, and that's enough. So I'm expecting, even though obviously the all-star game Fans are going to be from all over, uh, so there will be Astros fans there. But I mean, enough people hate the Astros. I'm expecting the Boo Birds to come out pretty tough. I thought Martin Maldonado was good, but he's batting one sixty eight. He fucking sucks. He's I don't think he's batted higher than like two twenty in the last five years. Their yeah. catcher is atrocious over there. All of his value comes from working with the pitching staff and what he does behind the plate. And he, I think he's a leader on that team in the clubhouse, too. He's been there a long time. Yeah, he's leading the trail back to the dugout after striking out. He's never been a good hitter. They even have him like sack bunt as much as they can. If they have a runner on first with no outs, they'll have him sack bunt. I bet he leads the league in sacks. But anyway. <laughs> to the chin. <laughs> he... uh. He everyone knows he's not a good hitter, but he'll boost one every now and then and he knows what to do. He just can't do it anymore. But he's getting older and all of his value comes from being behind the plate. Look at a guy like Zanino, but he had more pop, but also you could imagine him hitting one eighty two also. It was really no. cool to watch Zanino go to the Rays and then play just as bad. Mike one eighty two. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say Maldonado has no value. Might be a hot take, but no value. Fuck him. Yeah, Fuck they're the writing. Astros. They're writing Thanks, out Nate. his contract. <laughs> I was trying to hate on the Astros, and then Mr. Analytics had to yeah. tell me about how good he is. As how a do man. you qualify the they value? Have to but I appreciate of Nate. being like a team leader, like defensively. Doesn't matter. Sucks. They have to write out his contract until. Until he retires or whatever, I don't know. Until Riding he's a free it right agent. into a septic tank. Leadership doesn't show up on the stat card, so uh, doesn't matter. Maldonado sucks. <laughs> Fuck him. Other All Star news: The Mariners have three All Stars in- instead of just one. Mariner Moose, let's go. <laughs> nice. The Mariners have George Kirby, Julio Rodriguez, and Luis Castillo as the representatives for the All Star game. It's so much less embarrassing than I thought it was going to be, having one representative at our home field. Also, I'm just going to say, I personally thought George Kirby should have been the initial all-star. I agree. Originally, it was Luis Castillo, and then due to injuries, uh, McClanahan, the Rays pitcher being injured, had George Kirby join the roster, and then either Aaron Judge, Trout, or Alvarez, one of those guys being injured, then uh, caused Julio to then make the roster, and it should have been Kirby from the start. I don't think Castillo has necessarily been putting up an all-star caliber season. He's not having a bad season, but to be a representative for the Mariners, I think it most definitely should have been Kirby, and now he's in, and it's much deserved. Don't forget we have a Skipper Scott in there, too. 
or Mariners. That's right, Skipper Scott. Is Scott he like one of the, the? Yep. Is he one of the coaching he's, staff? He's on the coaching staff. Dusty Baker picked him, which uh, you know, wow. prop, props to him, I guess. Class act. Class also, act. I love Dusty Baker. I hate that he's the manager of the Astros. Agree. Dusty's the man. Dude, Luis Castillo has been sneaky good. His record doesn't show it, but he's struck out 117 dudes in 107 innings. He has a whip of 1.04, so, I mean, that's really good. 2.85 ERA, that's really good. That is really good. He's made all of his starts. I think it was mainly the walks catching up, and he has had a couple not Castillo caliber starts sprinkled throughout the year. We talked about how he gets hit hard, too. He does. That's the weird thing is, like, he has such crazy swing and miss, but when he gets hit, he gets hit hard. Like his barrel rate is just kind of mids. How do how do you miss bats so well, but then just get raked? It's it's kind of yeah. a weird thing with him. But I will say, 117 strikeouts, 28 walks. Like that's. I feel like all 28 of those walks came in like a four game span too. <laughs> I mean, he was leaving games with like five or six walks a start. That is insanely high. He's been going deeper into games. His last three starts, seven innings, six innings, seven innings. There were times earlier in the season where his pitch count would get up early and in like the fourth and fifth inning, and he'd have to come out in the fifth inning. And you're like, damn, come on, Luis. He's been way more efficient. He's he's a guy that's kind of effectively wild, and his stuff is so good, but when he leaves it over the middle of the plate, it gets hit pretty hard. He gets rocked. Yeah. Well, but I mean, all the Mariners are coming around. Luis Castillo included. Yeah. Maybe not Cal Raleigh, unfortunately. Yeah, he's still, he's kind of, that's actually a good point. He's kind of the last one to kind of get cooking. Suarez has turned it around. He's hit a few bombs. He had a two home run night the other night. Known power hitter, J.P. Crawford, yeah. has been roping bombs. Uh, Yeah, it's just kind of. Um, Tom Murphy's been excellent. Yeah, just kind of been... um, I want to give props to Tom Murphy also, if I can interject here. Yeah. We talked about Gilbert's complete game shutout. Murph behind the plate. Yeah, dude. All day. Murphy was there with Gilbert making the game plan, slicing and dicing. Maybe... How how often did Gilbert shake him? Who knows? They were on the same page all day, though. He knew what Gilbert was good at. He knew what the hitter's weaknesses were, and he made the game plan as just as much as Logan Gilbert did, and I just want to give props. He's been hitting very well, but his value behind the plate is super high as well. Like that, That's a special thing for a catcher to do as well. Garrett, you've actually mentioned kind of recently that you wanted to see a more 50-50 split between Tom Murphy and Cal Rowley. I do. Tom's bat is good. I think they're equally valuable behind the dish. Um, yeah, man. I would, I'd like to see Tom Murphy start more games, get more of an even split. I don't know about 50-50, 60-40, but closer to even than it is now for sure. I think that'd be great for us. Yeah, and it would be nice if uh, Cal's bat could finally start to come around because he's you know, trugging behind the train on this I mean, this shit, one. put them both in the lineup. Have Cal Raleigh start at DH. Murph can catch that game. And then if Cal Raleigh's not swinging the bat, you take him out. And well, he's put not Mike swinging Ford the bat in. at all this season, bro. What's that? He's not swinging the bat at all this season. I mean, yeah, you take Cal out, you put Mike Ford in. Bing, bang, boom, good to go. I don't like Cal Raleigh that much. What? Dude, shut, shut up. The fuck oh, up no, oh, my God. Oh, Come on. Shut up. No, yeah. He, I mean, yeah, he fucking got us to the playoffs. Cool. That is cool, dude. That was cool. No, that was cool. I watched moments. it. It was dope. But like, if we're just <laughs> yeah, talking, like, it. cool. Yeah, Demo hit the grand slam. Like, that was cool, right? I, I don't. Th- I wouldn't put Cal in the same category as Demo. Cal no, has, I know. Cal I know. I'm just using that as a comparison. Run, yeah, he did a lot more than just one home run. He's he just turned around this last year. year. He was hitting what point six nine until he got recalled up last year, nice. and then he. He still managed to hit, what, 210 or something? This man <laughs> literally talks shit about Maldonado having no value as a hitter, so therefore he's not a leader. What is fucking Cal Raleigh doing? Hey, same That's team. Maldonado brings nothing to the table. Cal Raleigh He's a good catcher, which is literally what Cal Raleigh is. We know he's underperformed, 
right? Or has he overperformed last year? Last year, <laughs> he ended up hitting like 27 bombs and hitting around 220 or something. Maybe 212, something like that. 218. I don't know. That's the but average catcher. If, Is that? If Catchers hit low. I know they hit a, low, but 212? A switch hitting catcher that has a cannon. Like He's good behind the plate. He works well with the pitching staff. I wouldn't say he's like necessarily elite back there, but a switch hitting catcher with power from the left side is pretty valuable. And he is one of the best offensive producing catchers, but he's been underperforming. We want him to take a step forward. He's taken a little step back, but I think he has enough to make those adjustments in the major leagues. It's not like I don't think he's on the trade block. I don't think there's anything we can do about it. It's okay that you don't like him, but... Until Harry Ford is here, I think we're going to see a lot of Cal Raleigh. Sorry, Hopefully, that's a little a good, bit more Tom Murphy. That's a good point. I don't. Sorry, I I misspoke. I not that I dislike <laughs> him. I just don't think he's performing very well. And I you were like you're right you're, about that. Yeah, you were like I hate Cal Raleigh. Yeah, he fuck fuck him. <laughs> and if we can pepper <laughs> no. in some more Tom Murphy, I'd be pretty happy. He's been on a roll. He's been seeing the ball well at the plate. He always puts in the extra work, and he deserves it. He deserves every chance to be in the lineup and crush. He boosts homers. He can hit doubles. He's a threat at the plate. He has good, like a good approach and knows the strike zone too, as a catcher especially. How many home runs does Cal Raleigh have? Oh, I actually have his stats up right now. He has eleven. It's pretty yeah, good. That's actually, that's, our, that's, that's more actually than more than I thought. <laughs> um, but an. Another thing to give Cal a little bit of longer leash here, too. Sophomore slumps are real. This is technically Cal's third season, but in his first season, he only played in 47 games. So that's not a full season. Last year was his first full season, and this year, you're I mean, Julio's been sophomore slumping. So I'm I'm not throwing in the towel at Cal at by any means. No, I absolutely love Cal. I think he's great for this team. He's just currently underperforming. I think he'll turn it around. Sophomore slumps are very real. And, yeah, he, I'm not worried at all. Oh, very real. I mean, I feel like I've said this like 27 times on the podcast before, but pitchers adjust faster than hitters do. It usually takes hitters, you know, they might have a great breakout season, sophomore slump, start to figure out pitching, you know, for real, maybe in their third, fourth year. Pitchers will figure out a a hitter in, you know, the second, third time facing them. They just adjust faster. It's a lot easier. It's not easier to be a good pitcher, but the adjustments can be made faster as a pitcher as far as game planning and figuring out a guy's weakness once you've seen him, you know, two, three times. Yeah, especially on a daily basis, you can do you can read swings well. Like sometimes the catcher can read the swing really well and call the right pitch at the right time. And yeah, pitchers are able to make those adjustments. They have nastier stuff than ever before. Hitters have to make the adjustments quick, and they can't get all in their head like we watched Kelnick do last year. I think Kelnick has made a good adjustment this year to not be in his head so much and show that he can make the run for a full season and see what shakes out. Same with Cal Raleigh. Like there were, those are guys that are able to figure it out at the major league level. And we're going to stick with and see what happens because we know the potential that they have. They've shown us they just need to do it consistently. And they're young. We've been saying they're young in this league. This is a young core that's emerging in the American league and it's surging finally. Teoscar Hernandez has significantly picked it up. Mike Ford has been a significant piece in our offense lately and has filled in at the DH role. Tom Murphy could use more time at the plate. And we're trying to add at the deadline. I guarantee we're trying to add to this team at the deadline. That's fair. I I didn't take into account how young Cal Raleigh was. So, (laughs) Yeah, Tom Murphy's older. Tom Murphy's played... Not very many games. 31 games has five home runs. What's his average? 277. Oh, let's go. Yeah, Tom Murphy's great. Really good. He's been really patient at the plate. He likes to get his pitch. He has a good eye. He'll walk, and he takes a big hack. When he decides to swing at a pitch, he's swinging at that pitch. 
I feel like Cal, Rolfe, Cal Raleigh's approach is literally just like every pitch I'm going to swing at it like it's a fucking meatloaf. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like a meatloaf. It looks like a spinning meatloaf. When you look at him, he looks like a meatloaf. Like a meatloaf. <laughs> I feel it, dude. Cal can look pretty fooled a lot. And they get him on the high fastball a lot. But when he connects with one of those, like, it's no joke. I don't know. Cal Raleigh, he's kind of an all or nothing catcher. Hit a bunch of bombs for low average, work well behind the plate with all of your pitchers, and call it good. We'll take 27 bombs with a 215 average. Yeah, and uh, you know we're now at a point where, again, we're looking at a ton of positives, and we're able to nitpick kind of these negatives in the lineup, which is a nice turn instead of everything just being negative. So it's nice to have, again, another positive outlook, something to look forward to. And hopefully we wrap up this series against the Astros, winning the series, sweeping the series. I mean, we can't do worse than split, so that's already a positive. And then the Mariners have the the All-Star break, a nice little three-day rest after the All-Star game on Tuesday. The All-Star game's here in Seattle, by the way. Yeah. Like, what <laughs> the hell? I'm excited. I'm going to the Home Run Derby. Nice. Yeah, dude, I'm stoked. The Home Run Derby is going to be electric. The All-Star Game is going to be electric. There's still tickets on all kinds of apps and everything. Go get them. Go to the game. For the Home Run Derby last year, did Julio, went, was he seated against Alonzo in the like opening round? In the second, second round, I think they went against each second other in the round. second round. I don't yeah. know. I don't know. I can't remember exactly, but I know whoever Julio played in the first round, he smoked. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think Julio and Alonzo are part are like tiered up against each other this year in the first round. So yeah. that's going to be an electric round. I'm so excited for the home run derby. I last went when I was in 2001. And Luis Gonzalez on the Arizona Diamondbacks won it. I remember that. My memory's a little fit, fuzzy. I was like 10 years old. but I looked up the slate. I think it was like Barry Bonds was in the lineup. It was. I think Jason uh, Giambi yeah, was part of it. Giambi was I remember in there. Giambi like roping bombs off the Hit It Here Cafe. Alex Rodriguez was in it. Brett Boone. I missed that one. I watched it on TV, but uh, that's why I'm so happy to be going to this one. It only happens once in a blue moon, but uh, not a sponsor. <sighs> Come on, Blue Moon, sponsor us already. Shout out Blue Moon. <laughs> Is Blue Moon's even still popping off anymore? I haven't yeah, seen dude, a Blue Moon they in so long. Big baseball podcast. It's like old. What older people drink? You gotta get that orange slice in there though. Blue hey, Moon. On they're not its- paying us. Cut that shit. The out. Valencia <laughs> orange. Peel it needs an orange coriander. slice to be good. Kicking off the All Star Week though already was the inaugural HBCU Swingman Classic. The Ken Griffey Jr. put together this essentially All Star game for HBCU players, which is historically black colleges and universities. And I was actually at the game tonight. I left that to come to this. And it was really, really cool. Um, it's so awesome to see the game kind of grow this way. And for Ken Griffey to give back to the community and stuff like that is huge. The event was so fun. I had an amazing time there. There is something I saw, though, that is... I don't, I don't know the right word for it. Um... During the pregame warmups, while all the teams are like on the field doing drills, they had just like fans behind home plate. There was like a little rope, and the fans were in the dirt, like the warning track area behind home plate. And the teams were doing live drills, and they were hitting fungo out into the outfield, and the outfielders had to fire at home. And this one right fielder absolutely airmailed the ball and hit this fan right in the head. It was a lady absolutely domed her and she was down on the ground for like 20 minutes. It was like pretty extreme. She ended up being okay. She left. Uh, They had her in a wheelchair and she had like an ice pack on her head. But uh, why were they having fans there during live drills? Like it, it made no sense for them to be standing there. It was an air on Whoever 
you know, poor planning. It was poor planning. Whoever planned that, that was terrible, and that was crazy to see. Yeah, put did those. She, did she get to? Did she get to keep the ball at least? I don't. I don't know. I hope oh. so. <laughs> I but, hope so too. At least put those fans on the top rail of the dugout and let them watch from there. That's good enough, right? Yeah, I think it was promotion. It might have been players' families or like families of players and stuff like that. I don't know. But there was a good crowd of people on the field while live drills were happening, and this chick got absolutely tagged. Oops. Yeah. Scary moment. I hope she's okay. She's honestly probably dealing with at least a concussion. She got... Oh, my God. I mean, it was a full-on crow hop throw from the outfield to the plate that just was nowhere near, just sailed and That does not her. feel good. No. Um, so they probably won't do that anymore, uh, having fans on the field during live drills but despite that the rest of the event was amazing it was really really cool seeing all these young players and stuff and get a chance to shine in the spotlight and you know that's just day one tomorrow there's the celebrity softball and futures game which also shout out anthony callahan the winner of our giveaway shout out anthony thanks anthony then sunday the draft which, you know, the draft is kind of weird for baseball because half these players don't even make major league rosters, or if they do, you don't see them for like four years. But the Mariners have three first-round draft picks, which is the most that a team has had since the 2016 San Diego Padres. So the Mariners have a chance to load up on farm talent this draft. Three first-round picks, that's huge. And then, of course, Monday, got the home run derby. And Tuesday, the All-Star Game. So, nice little fun week. And then um, three days off after that. Now, also, this Mariners Sogcast, we are taking our All-Star break. We will not have an episode for you guys next week. Uh, Garrett, Matt, and I will be at the Gorge for a bachelor party. That will be exciting. Our boy Mike's getting hitched. Yeah. Shout out, Mike. Congratulations. And so, we got the bachelor's party, so we will not be here next week. Um, that's okay with the gap and everything. We're not really missing that much. So we will talk to you all in two weeks. Thank you all so much for listening. Make sure to like, comment, subscribe, share, tell your friends. We're also looking forward to doing more giveaways in the future. Uh, we don't have anything planned right now, but if we do, we'll let you know. And hopefully you guys some win some cool shit. Thank you all for listening and go Mariners. A good week of Mariners baseball. What do we got to recap? Shit, all of it, man. It was a good one. You guys see that game uh, yesterday, Thursday, where uh, JP fielded that great ground ball, and then it was Chaz- a great ground ball. That ground ball was so good looking. Okay, well, he fielded the shit out of that great <laughs> ground ball. That great ground ball play. <laughs> Did you guys? <laughs> <laughs> fucking assholes. <laughs> I love ground balls. They're great.